Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ARC's FYI podcast. I'm Yassine. I cover crypto at ARC, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by the rest of ARK's crypto team, Frank Downing and David Puel. I think this is a long uh, overdue get together and I, actually the first time the three of us are sitting down to record a podcast. So very excited about this uh, monumental event. Uh, in the face of uh, crypto's market volatility and uh, some of the massive deleveraging and contagion we've seen play out over the last few months, we thought this would be a great opportunity to give some market perspective highlight a few charts um, and, and stats from ARK's most recent edition of the Bitcoin Monthly, and then go over some of the main themes that we're thinking about through the second half of this year. Um, so with that, Frank, why don't you uh, start with a quick recap of what the last three months have, have meant for crypto? Yeah, sure, you see. Um, it's been kind of since the beginning of May, where we've really had turmoil in the crypto markets leading up to when we're recording this in early August. Uh, that really all began with the collapse of the Terra protocol and the UST stablecoin. Uh, so what we saw was a event where a $20 billion stablecoin, UST, broke its peg and unwound, eventually going uh, essentially to zero. And in the process, hyperinflated and devalued its counterpart token, the Luna token. Uh, if you look at this in terms of magnitude, this is a $20 billion stablecoin and a $30 billion liquid token. Uh, so $50 billion total that completely unwound over the course of several days. Uh, and while this event looked like it was fairly localized at the time, for example, 75% uh, of the UST supply was just used on Terra's one lending market anchor to get this 20% yield that was manufactured in the protocol. We started to learn over the following weeks and months dominoes that were triggered uh, based on certain parties that had exposure to the Terra protocol. And two of those um, most notable ones were Celsius, one of the largest crypto lending platforms that at one point was managing over $20 billion in customer assets, and Three Arrows Capital, a notable crypto hedge fund that was uh, also managing somewhere between 10 to $18 billion at its peak. We learned of Celsius' exposure to um, Terra because they had taken client assets and staked them through Lido, uh, their liquid staked Ether product, and bridged them over to the Terra ecosystem to participate in that 20% yield farming uh, that I mentioned. And so while they didn't lose assets directly from UST and Luna uh, devaluing uh, because they had their assets in the staked Ether, it brought a lot of exposure to some of the more aggressive higher risk ways that they were generating yield for their client assets, which was notably higher than their peers in the lending markets, such as uh, BlockFi, for example. And so over the next several weeks, uh, on-chain analysts started to understand more about Celsius's position and learned that a significant amount of their customer assets were deployed in DeFi lending markets. And some of those in, in quite illiquid uh, positions, notably the stake Ether position, and also direct staking in Ethereum's uh, 2.0 proof of stake network that led for um, Celsius to have only a minority of their uh, Ether balance uh, in liquid ETH. And so as people started to realize this, funds rushed out of the platform and eventually Celsius had to pause withdrawals. And shortly after, uh, we learned file for bankruptcy. Uh, another party that was tied to this uh, event was Three Arrows Capital, which a very notable and, and uh, up until this point reputable uh, hedge fund in the crypto space also had exposure to staked Ether and suffered from 
staked Ether uh, drawing down in value against uh, Ether as money fled out of the token. Also had exposure to Terra directly in their portfolio investments in, in Luna and were supporters even as the peg started to break on that um, on the UST token. Uh, what we what we then learned more about was how Three Arrows had come to manage so much money. A large portion of that was uh, from loans that they had taken out, pretty much borrowing from every corner of the crypto space. Uh, so notable funds like uh, or notable firms like uh, Genesis and Blockchain.com all had lent uh, Three Arrows Capital, uh, you know, more than more than a billion dollars each. And uh, it turns out because of Three Arrows reputation in the crypto space had given them essentially sweetheart deals and allowing looser collateral requirements uh, for them to borrow versus what they give their day to day customers. And what happened is as these events started happening, as Terra unwound, as Celsius halted withdrawals and eventually filed for bankruptcy, crypto markets sold off and Three Arrows wasn't able to uh, meet margin calls that they had with all of these creditors. And so ultimately, this ended with Three Arrows filing for bankruptcy at the beginning of July. Uh, and kind of a slew of crypto lending providers that all had exposure uh, on their books of lending to Three Arrows Capital also had to either file for bankruptcy, Voyagers, another one, or pause withdrawals uh, as they figure out their liquidity situation. Looking kind of at the rest of July and, and you know into, into the forward months, one thing that's been kind of comforting to us is to see the magnitude of these events start to slow down and decrease in size, as it seems most of the dust is settling and the contagion is now relatively contained um, to uh, the events that we've already seen and the dominoes we've already seen fall. Right. So this conversation feels much more like a post-mortem analysis than it does we're in the the depths of uh, uncertainty. I, I'd say that, you know, Terra's demise, general consensus, that it, it is one of the largest fiascos in, in, in crypto market history. Uh, and, and remember, we had conducted analysis on, as measured by market capitalization, how much relative market capitalization was affected by this collapse compared to just really the Mt. Gox hacks in, in, in Mt. Gox hack in, in 2014, it's still 7% of outstanding Bitcoin. Terra's collapse has destroyed roughly 3% of crypto's total market cap. And then on top of that, there's all this additional domino effect selling pressure. Uh, but I think to your, to your point, Frank, it seems like there's, a, there's an interesting kind of, I'd say, settling of the dust where the size of every marginal fallout associated with Terra uh, is d- diminishing. Uh, I think in the process, though, this has sent the entire market into capitulation. And as, as we'll get into, uh, you know, Bitcoin's uh, price broke its 200-week moving average. ETH fell below its 2017 all-time high. Uh, but again, it seems like, you know, the leverage unwinding and, and the creditors realizing their losses is in Celsius and 3AC filing for great bankruptcy. Now it is the time uh, to really, you know, think about what that path to recovery looks like. So, you know, maybe we'll go into a little bit uh, and, and David can spearhead here of, uh, of a market analysis on, on just broader price action uh, that was featured in the Bitcoin Monthly. I know many of our listeners are audio only, uh, so you should be able to get, you know, more, more than enough context without having the, the visualization. But for those who are both audio video, I'm um, pulling up uh, some of the charts from our most recent Bitcoin Monthly. David? Yeah, so um, as this whole capitulative event uh, unfolded in the crypto markets, we we went into a major drawdown um, after picking uh, um, earlier this year uh, and then proceeded to fall over 72%, more or less, below our 200-week moving average, a four-year trend, which has been historically very robust support for Bitcoin. Um, in fact, it has um, been slightly below it or added about seven times previously and a year after, uh, on, on average, a year after every one of those times, the returns for Bitcoin were uh, over 100%. So very robust support. 
we went slightly below it, closed under it for about four or five weeks. And then just at the end of July, we regained that level and we're currently trading above it. Uh, also important uh, is that we pretty much went slightly below, but on a you know longer term horizon, we touched the um, 2017 previous all-time high for Bitcoin, which is uh, usually, you know, a previous all-time high is always seen as a major uh, supportive zone. We, we also bounced off of that level to regain the 200-week moving average. Uh, so it's all indicative of a, a robust support level that it's so far holding, but we're, we're keeping an eye for, you know, any continuing in the um, capitulation capitulation in the uh, in the crypto markets but also most importantly uh, any further uncertainty in the macro environment yeah david you mentioned you know this 72 percent drawdown which sounds absolutely crazy uh for those who maybe haven't been through uh traditional kind of crypto market cycles uh, i think it is helpful when giving those numbers to put it in the context of you know what previous bear market drawdowns look like um and and so you know this chart uh and, and broadly when you look at price drawdowns from all-time highs uh there's kind of an you know interesting perspective that relative to all-time highs uh you know this drawdown is actually more consistent with an intracyclical correction like what we saw with the covid collapse in 2020 rather than you know a global cyclical bottom like we saw in 2018 or 2015 where Bitcoin usually goes through a greater than uh, 80% correction. So if, if the bear market is like previous ones, this could mean we see another leg down. Uh, but because you know we, Bitcoin's price didn't really you know, go through a, a parabolic rise and blow off top in the 2021 bull market, uh, and we've seen some of the contagion now uh, fully play out, uh, it, it wouldn't be surprising us to, to that to see you know that we don't see as significant as a drawdown um, as we've seen in previous bear markets. What about in terms of holding behavior, David, uh, and in, in broader cost basis of the market? Can you kind of explain where we're at there? Right. So going back to the on-chain, uh, the on-chain cost basis of the market, also known as realized price, uh, that is uh, about twenty-three, twenty-four um, thousand dollars. Uh, we're currently at it or, or trading slightly above it, which is also very uh, increases the, our, our bullish conviction, uh, just as, you know, regaining the 200 week moving average level. Um, this on chain cost basis has proved uh, very consistent as an accumulation, general accumulation zone whenever market price is trading below that co cost basis. And also importantly, when it regains that cost basis, it's and and it, and it trades above it for a continued period of, of time. It's also a very good signal that the market has completed mean reversion, and it's now at, at equilibrium and accumulation can take place once again. Uh, now, in addition to the to that line, we we also have a modified version of realized gap. You know. If we remember the definition of realized gap or cost basis, it would be tracking every single coin at the price of entry when that coin, when each and every single coin last moved, and then you add that together and you get a, a new uh, realized gap, right? Um, so we adjusted that uh, to only account for investor cost basis uh, by subtracting the minor, the cumulative minor revenue of miners, otherwise known as thermo cap. And we, we were left with a, an investor price or an investor cost basis that gives us um, a more accurate or adjusted version to, to evaluate bottom uh, levels on any given cycle. Now, we touched that level as well uh, at about 19,000. Uh, and that, that also increases our, our bullish conviction. But um, to counter that a little bit more, when we evaluate the correction against delta price, which is a price adjusted um, uh, realized price and usually follows a worst case scenario support for us, uh, price didn't get to the, that level at about 14,000 or so. 
so still uh, leaves room for for more correction but the fact that we not only regained realized price but also touched invers uh, investor price uh, before uh, regaining the 200 week moving average and realized price uh, increases our, our bullish conviction um, going forward so we're keeping we're keeping a close eye on those levels yeah I, th I think it's it definitely is good to see that the market capitalization is now trading above the the cost basis uh, of the market uh, I think to David's point, of the three major cost bases or on-chain cost bases that we look at, uh, in this correction, uh, Bitcoin's price breached below two of the major ones, but not the final third one, uh, and has since recovered. Uh, again, when you compare that to relative uh, markets, uh, previous market cycles, this this too is much more resemblant of the COVID crisis than it is the 2018 uh, bear market. Uh, so in terms of fundamentals, I think what's really interesting and, and across the board, what's been quite reassuring to see is that not only have they remained intact, but it seems like they've proven to be resilient in the face of this significant deleveraging and, and kind of gross mismanagement from centralized counterparts. Uh, it's particularly when it comes to some of the DeFi protocols that were involved um, you know, in, in, in centralized counterparties using them and interfacing with them. Uh, Frank, do you want to kind of give some of the biggest learnings that we've seen uh, through uh, kind of the, this this turmoil uh, and what the current state of DeFi infrastructure looks like? Yeah, I think this is this is really interesting takeaway from from the past three months and all the deleveraging that's happened. Um, if you look at what the the failure points were when the market was stressed. Uh, they ended up being the the centralized counterparties and not these decentralized protocols, which I think is counterintuitive to what uh, many from the outside might have thought. So you had parties like Celsius and Voyager that mismanaged risk, uh, got over their skis, and uh, eventually faced insolvencies that led them to file for bankruptcy. Um, if you look at the DeFi world, which some of these centralized counterparties were interacting with, uh, the largest largest lending markets on Ethereum, uh, Aave and Compound, for example, have weathered a 67% decline in total deposits, all while functioning really as designed. There were no major outages or major insolvencies. Uh, those who were over levered were liquidated uh, as they as the protocols designed that they should be. Um, but we saw really uh, a robust functioning of the protocols. Uh, now, there's parts of uh, what you could consider DeFi that went wrong under stress. And I think Terra is a good example of that. Uh, but that's more an example of a poorly designed protocol mechanism rather than uh, a failure of something not acting as it's designed. Looking at what's happened on a, on a total level, we've seen the the total uh, deposits in these lending markets go draw down from $40 billion to $15 billion. And the aggregate collateralization level so how much collateral there is for how much loans are taken out uh, rise to over uh, 300%. And so on a, on a net basis, we've seen the total leverage uh, decline in the system, so less total risk being taken, and positions on, a, on an aggregate basis are healthier as well. Uh, so DeFi functioned as designed, and now where we're sitting, uh, the system has kind of less leverage and more healthier positions, which I think is really promising. And and shows, uh, especially in the face of centralized lenders collapsing, the promise of these uh, protocols and the strength of kind of smart contract infrastructure in the long run uh, going forward. And based on price action, it seems like the market has largely kind of priced this in, especially relative to Bitcoin. Uh, can you kind of explain just just briefly what what the roadmap in the, in the coming year, or call it six months, or I guess even month for ether it, it looks like uh and and maybe how that has has translated to i'd say strength in, in the eth bitcoin pair we've also seen some you know really interesting metrics around all-time highs and in open interest for you know eth futures and eth trade and eth futures trading volume um so how do you think this kind of plays out for ether uh in in the short to midterm I think we've seen something interesting just in the last month, which is uh, when, when the markets were heading down and we were in this kind of capitulation cycle, 
Uh, you had assets uh, on the riskier end of the spectrum. So ETH and assets that are built on top of ETH uh, in comparison to Bitcoin sell off really hard. And uh, not necessarily trading on fundamentals, but market going completely risk off. Uh, just in the latter half of, of July, I think that that started to turn. And we saw the market uh, incrementally at the margin is starting to trade more on fundamentals. And for ETH's case, this was mostly around uh, progress made around their transition, the network's transition to proof of stake consensus, uh, dubbed the, the merge. And while this has been anticipated for uh, really over seven years since the network launched, uh, we're now looking closer than ever to that transition actually happening with the uh, anticipated date being sometime uh, in September. Um, the, the milestones to get there have been migrating Ethereum's test nets over the past several months. And the last test net to merge is actually supposed to happen uh, later today when we're recording this. Uh, so those have been relatively successful and uh, show promise that the merge is actually going to take place. And so many parties, uh, you know, having this technical and execution risk uh, in the past, as well as the changes to ETH tokenomics that uh, reduce total issuance and, and the narrative around proof of state consensus compared to proof of work, uh, have led to a lot of interest in purchasing ETH as a token. And so we've seen the ETH BTC pair, or the price of ETH relative to Bitcoin, outperform, uh, which has been a divergence from the risk off period that we've seen. So relatively, market is back uh, to risk on for these types of assets. And this is something that we like to see kind of this long trend of ETH increasing in value relative to Bitcoin as a sign of the growing strength of the crypto ecosystem as a whole. If you look at what we classify as uh, described as the, the financial and internet revolutions compared to uh, the monetary revolution, which is embodied by Bitcoin, uh, that represents roughly 50% of the crypto market cap and ETH being uh, kind of the, the dominant asset within that bucket. So seeing the strength is, is net bullish for crypto as a whole. Right. And I, and I think ideally, we, we'd like to see over time just a complete uh, decoupling of correlation between call it the major crypto trading pairs. Uh, but in the face of strong correlation, what we tend to see, uh, to your point, is is sort of strong uh, sell-offs, uh, during strong sell-offs, uh, Bitcoin outperforming ETH uh, or, or, or risk, risk off periods. And then during risk on periods, we see usually an outperformance of ETH relative to Bitcoin. Uh, and so I think it's, it's quite uh, promising to see that, I'd say that the last month or so, uh, we've seen kind of significant outperformance of ETH r relative to Bitcoin, which again, kind of suggests that perhaps the market is ready um, to, to go back risk on. In terms of what we're looking at in kind of the short to mid to, to long term, I guess all three, David, are there any metrics, I think in particular, uh, that we're looking at, um, let's say on a short to midterm basis, uh, that, that, that if let's say f flags a, a specific number, we will we'll sort of be, I'd say, even more confident that that this path to recovery is on its way. Sure. So um, let's take uh, SOPR, for instance, which is spent output profit ratio. It basically is an aggregate between the, the average price where coins were bought and the average price where those coins were sold. So it's basically tracking realized profits or losses uh, in the network at any given time. Uh, now, what we usually find when we explore this metric is when there's a one-to-one -one proportion between entry and exit, meaning the market is at break-even, uh, you usually see support or, or resistance, which makes perfect sense, right? Basically, what you're tracking is if people are at a loss and we return and the market returns to a, a break, an aggregate break even point, then a lot of people have the potential of selling at break even, not to assume any further risk. And therefore, that's a resistance, right? So right now, after the, the drawdown, uh, uh, starting with May after Luna and then Celsius, Three Arrows and all that, uh, we have capitulated and returned to, to one, meaning the, the, the break-even level aggregate of the market. Uh, now, this is a resistance. 
which uh, is slightly above the major support levels, but um, regaining it would mean a, a great deal in terms of increasing uh, voice conviction uh, in general. This metric usually, the, the, the way to track it over time is if you're in a bear market overall, you find the tops at one or the break even point. And if you're in a bull market overall, you find the bottoms of that bull market at break even as well. Uh, so now uh, we, we've been uh, flipping um, above and below it. And now we are um, at one from below, which is powerful resistance now. If we regain and, and surpass that level and, and with strength, um, it could be a, another indication that we may be rejoining um, at least a, a flat to bullish or, or a neutral to bullish environment. Now, if we regain the level of one and go above it and then uh, visit the break even area once again uh, from above, that that would be um, very connotative of having a um, being in a bull market and testing a bottom at that stage. Now, this may be uh, several months uh, down the line, but uh, some of the things we're keeping an eye on uh, on a short to midterm basis. Yeah, I think that's super helpful. And so a as we kind of weather this storm, um, there are, I'd say, a few top of mind themes that we're looking at uh, that a lot of, um, you know, of the, of the community is, is talking about. Uh, one is around really what the next wave or where the next wave of, of demand or institutional demand is going to come from and how kind of regulation uh, in light of some of the recent events that have transpired will play a role in either inhibiting or encouraging adoption. On the institutional demand side, I think last week Coinbase's announcement of a, a partnership with BlackRock was really the, some of the strongest signal that we've seen in terms of institutions considering kind of crypto as an, an entirely new asset class, starting with Bitcoin. It seems like uh, this was years in the making, but that Wall Street uh, is now finally ready to make this leap. Uh, at the core of that partnership is really this compelling interconnection between Coinbase Prime and, and BlackRock's Aladdin. Uh, Aladdin is uh, BlackRock's portfolio management software that supports nearly $22 trillion in assets and managed by 55,000 investment professionals. Uh, and so now you have this entire user base of institutional uh, professionals that are going to be able to access Coinbase's uh, prime brokerage services, their trading, their reporting, their custody solutions, so a partnership like this could could definitely um, usher trillions of dollars into the into this asset class in the coming years. Uh, I think the flip side to that, uh, specifically when it comes to Coinbase and sort of kind of broader sentiment on, on regulation, is that you know there there might be a few barriers uh, where where regulators aren't really ready to make the leap themselves. I think particularly notable are are uh, two recent events. Uh, that maybe, Frank, you want to qu quickly discuss as we wrap this up uh, around the most recent sort of securities uh, regulation and uncertainty around uh, some of Coinbase's listing. And then, and then perhaps, um, let's say, more of an, a philosophical or ideological question around, uh, you know, OFAC and, and the Treasury Department and the most recent uh, tornado cash news. Yeah, sure. I think I think the regulation is definitely top of mind, especially with these news stories. Uh, first, first on the insider trading case, um, this was uh, two cases launched: one by the DOJ and one by the SEC against a former Coinbase employee, which uh, were essentially around this Coinbase employee uh, informing uh, his his brother and and close friend of assets that were going to be listed on the Coinbase platform. Pretty clear case of of insider trading and misuse of um, non public information at Coinbase. Uh, the, the interesting part for, for Coinbase and the crypto industry more broadly is that in the process of uh, making their case, the SEC declared uh, eight assets uh, that were um, or nine assets that were traded as uh, digital asset securities. Um, whether um, a crypto asset is deemed a security or a commodity or 
something else yet to be determined in the regulatory view has been a hot topic in crypto for quite some time and something that regulators have been um, hesitant to give more clarity on outside of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and so this is really the SEC making a move here to start with the largest publicly traded crypto exchange, uh, starting to declare what they deem to be securities. Uh, none of these are extremely large by crypto market cap. They're all under $200 million. Uh, but the SEC clearly applies, uh, in a, in a, um, you know, 50 page plus, uh, document, uh, the Howey test to, to explain their case for why they consider these securities. Um, Coinbase, has uh, a public uh, digital asset listing policy that they've also shared with the SEC, and they're adamant that they haven't listed securities. Uh, so now with rumors that the SEC is also looking into Coinbase around those policies, I think we'll see this over the next 6 to 12 months become a bigger issue in the spotlight. Um, lastly, uh, what you referred to, you've seen, is the uh, Tornado Cash incident where the Treasury Department, OFAC, has uh, essentially launched sanctions against Tornado Cash crypto mixing service uh, on Ethereum that essentially enables private transactions uh, of Ether and USDC and other coins. This has been used by individuals seeking greater privacy uh, in their crypto asset holdings, as well as um, malicious groups uh, seeking to launder uh, illicitly gained funds uh, through various uh, DeFi hacks. Um, over $7 billion measured by the Treasury Department in their, um, in their announcement. Um, so this brings up a lot of kind of enforcement questions of how can you really um, launch a case uh, or sanction a, a smart contract or piece of open source software, uh, as well as kind of implications for for other pieces of open source software like decentralized exchanges. Um, so lots lots more on that to come, uh, I think, as well over the next six to twelve months. All right, thank you guys. Uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Appreciate everyone tuning in again. We publish the Bitcoin Monthly uh, on arc-invest.com. It's a monthly report where we go through um, much of the happenings of that of, of the month uh, and then give an overview of kind of where we see the market headed in the coming month. So stay tuned for next month's edition. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you very much. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.